bring out, Jesus said, I, uh, the son gives life to whom he wishes. The word life is two things. One is eternal life. One is the life now. Eternal life, I don't think we need to elaborate, but I want to talk about the life now here. We have seen so much brokenness, and I myself have seen it. With my family and my surroundings, my relatives, my extended family, and, and, my, and everything. You, you all have seen it. We need some good news of what God has done and God will do. Let's look at two examples. First example is, is the, in, a, in Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 18. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4, 17 to 18. And it's, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. This is about Abraham. In the presence of a God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Oh, this is a powerful line. I want to capture that. God gives life to the dead. You don't need to give life to what is already alive. God gives life to the dead. You may have a relationship or, or working that is dead or half dead or problems. You may see your son, your daughter struggle, spiritual deadness. And you know, that's where God comes in. God gets all the glory because Abraham was 97 years old or so. And the wife, his wife Sarah was 94, 95 years old. No child, barren. Can you imagine? God promised Abraham he would be the father of many nations as many as the stars in the sky. And yet at 97 years old, he is childless. You can imagine the struggle and the anguish. As far as his descendants is concerned, it's dead. He's, he's gone. Even even. Abraham one time talked to God, God, you promised all this thing. Thank you, Lord. But you know what? My servant will be my heir. Because Abraham's given up. You know, we all come to a point where we all feel like giving up. That's where you need the life that God promised. That's the what Abraham experienced. He went through a, a traumatic and huge disappointment in life. But you know, he never got bitter with God. You see that? He never said, God, why didn't you do this? You promised. He never even said that. He just said, Lord. He said indirectly. He said, God, yeah, you made me reach your promise. Of, you know what? My servant will be my heir. And God heard that. God responded and said, Abraham, your servant, whatever his name is, will not be your heir. Let's get this right. You will have a son out of your bosom. You will have a son, and he will inherit your name, and he will be part of, the, part, of the, part of the work of God to raise a huge family, the whole nation of Israel. And us now, those in Christ Jesus and all the churches through Father Abraham. And God said, don't doubt, believe. That is faith. Faith in life. It is the thing is, the faith is your faith or God's work. I want to get this clear out to you all because you may be struggling. I'm not teaching you to get more faith, more faith, believe, believe. That would be wrong. That was me before. But I want to tell you that in the redemption of Christ, Jesus has died on the cross because he resurrected from the, from the, from the, from the death and now he gives us the power to have that faith. I don't want you to say, God, give me faith. Give me faith. I, I, I believe and I believe. You pound your floor and say, give me, where is my faith? But you should turn to Christ. Jesus, Lord, I believe in you. Help my unbelief. That's exactly the father was, is it father or mother? Crying out for his son or her son. Asking Jesus to heal. And I think Jesus, Jesus said, if you believe, nothing is impossible. And the father cried out, oh Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Oh, that is so beautiful. That is the thing that touched Jesus. The Lord said, your son is healed. Help my unbelief. And I'm not saying that everything will happen exactly as what we wanted, as long as we have faith. 
But you have, to, you have to have faith in Christ, in what he wants for you, for me. Because what he wants may be a little bit different from what we want. Did you know here that the Lord's Prayer, which I should, later I'll lead you in Lord's Prayer, if I, hopefully I remember. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it's in heaven. Such a powerful verse. You, you guys should pray the Lord's Prayer frequently in your prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hello, 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 hello be thy name, means holy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will. If you have faith, all the faith, you muster all the faith in, the, in, in your own will, which is different from God's will, it will never happen. The overriding thing is God's will and the cross of Jesus Christ. But Abraham, clearly it is in God's will because God promised him. And that's why it says, God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. That's his specialty. That's so powerful. God calls things that do not exist. <laughs> I put it this way. God calls, what is the word? God calls into existence something that do not exist. From nothing into something. God never created you and I from something else. He created you from nothing. The whole cosmos, the world, the universe are created by God out of nothing. That's God. That is that's how powerful it is. That Romans 4 is a very powerful, that's why I liked it. And, and Abraham's wife was dead womb for years and years, and he and the time came, Sarah conceived. That's that's life. That's powerfully demonstrated. Now, and Jesus said, I have come to give life, right? That's a good verse. John chapter 10, verse 10 to 11. John chapter 10, verse 10 to 11 says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life, life of abundance. Now, if you stop there, then you're not complete because you have to read the next one. Remember, I always teach you, say this, right? When you read a passage, you must read it in context. You must read it, understand what we call biblical theology, the whole uni unity of the scripture. Verse 11 says that, you see, it said, uh, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but I have come to give you life, life of abundance. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. That's why you had the life of abundance. You must have Jesus as your good shepherd. And what does the next, what is, what's the verse say? Verse 11, I, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Oh, do you hear that? The good shepherd is just not just being good, comfortable, comfy, hugs you. When you're down, encourage you and give you things. He's not a vending machine. He's not a help button. He is your good shepherd. And what does a good shepherd do? He lays down his life. Now we're talking. The good shepherd is defined by the word he lays down his life. All talk is talk, hot air. Do it and show it to me. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, you can have abundant life because I'm the good shepherd. I will lead you into green pastures. That's why your life will be abundant. Abundant life does not mean that abundant money or abundant scholarship or whatever. Though that may be a blessing. But he promises you a life of abundance, the green pasture where you find rest in your soul. Your soul will be refreshed. You will never dry up. I am the good shepherd. The reason I'm the good shepherd, Jesus said, because I lay down my life. You know, without the death of Christ, there is no Christianity. The death and resurrection of Christ. There is no abundant life. Everything keys in on Jesus dying on the cross, pay for the sins of the world and resurrect. And he becomes our redeemer. He redeemed us. So that we are no more in condemnation. That's so powerful. So ESV, Crossway Commentary, put it this way, very beautifully. Jesus calls his followers not to a doer, means uh, boring, doer, lifeless, miserable existence that squashes human potential. Such a beautiful way, right? Jesus did not call us to follow him 